G'day guys, in this particular video I'll be tying three crucial concepts together through two really useful formulas. And those two formulas are dm dx is equal to v of x, and also dv, that's dv dx, is equal to minus w of x. Now, m stands for the internal bending moment at a point x, v stands for the internal shear force at a point x, and w stands for your distributed load at a point x. Okay, now, this is a pretty tough formula to derive. It involves a lot of calculus if you want to do it right, so I, I strongly recommend that you continue only if you've got a fairly good understanding of calculus. Okay, well, in order to prove this particular, these particular formulas, we need to actually take a finite-sized chunk and analyze it using a free body diagram. So here we've got our bridge with our distributed load over it. Let's take a finite chunk from that bridge and analyze it. So this is what it looks like. It's got a length delta x just here. Delta x just here. That's because this chunk has a length delta x here. And let's draw all the forces acting on it. Well, first, th first things first, we know it's got a very generic distributed load acting on it, which looks like that. Also, because we've taken cuts to both the left and the right of the chunk, it's going to have both internal shear forces and internal moments on it. So we're going to have a shear force, V, at our point X, and also our moment, M, at our point X. Now, on the right-hand side, we'll also have internal shear forces and bending moments, but because it's at a point x plus delta x, they'll actually look like this. This will be, in fact, let me scroll over, this will be v of x plus delta x, and this will be m of x plus delta x. Okay, I hope that makes sense. All right, and before I continue with the mathematics, let me also define a new variable. I'm going to define epsilon as being from here, basically where x ends, onwards. So this is epsilon just here. So this is epsilon from here onwards just here. I'm defining epsilon to be along this along this chunk that I've taken. Okay, let me get that back into size and zoom out and we're good. Okay, cool. Um, now, because we know this bar is in static equilibrium, that means we know it satisfies the condition that the sum of forces in the vertical direction is equal to zero. This is really useful because if we take the sum of forces is equal to zero, we get the sum of forces going up is equal to the sum of forces going down, which is V of X plus delta X plus your net resultant force due to this distributed load. Now, what's the net resultant force due to this distributed load? Well, in order to do that, let me just redraw our chunk just here of length, D, de, of length delta x just here. This is our distributed load, right? That's our distributed load, as generic as it gets. And this is going to be epsilon just here. Now, if... W is a force per unit length. So if we just take the area under this curve, the total area under this curve, that will give us the total force due to this distributed load. And to understand why, let's actually go through it step by step. Let's cover, a, let's, let's analyze a small slither of this curve under here. That is going to be your small element of your force DF. Right? That's because this is a force per unit length. If we get the force per unit length, times it by its corresponding length, that gives us our force. What is DF? Well, it'll be the area of this slither, which is going to be W of epsilon times by d epsilon, right? That's the area of this slither. That's because this right here has a length d epsilon and a height of, I think it's from there to there, of W of epsilon. Okay, so that is df. Now, if we want to account for the entire force due to um, this entire distributed load over our length d epsilon, we just integrate. So this is going to be from w of epsilon d epsilon with limits of integration from 0 to delta x, right? And I should say from 0, this is when epsilon is equal to 0, and this is when epsilon is equal to delta x. Okay, well, let's actually rearrange this formula. We know if we rearrange this, we can get V of X plus delta X minus V of X is equal to, is equal to minus the integral from zero to X of W of epsilon D epsilon, right? Now I'm going to divide both sides by DX, and you'll see why in a second. But if we 
divide both sides by delta x, then we're left with this. This is going to be delta x over delta x. That's just a rearranged version of what we had above. We know that if we take the limits as, x, as delta x approaches 0, then we're going to get dv dx on the left-hand side. But what is this term? What is the right-hand side term? It's a pretty complicated thing to grasp, but let's actually do it step by step. And to do that, let me just redraw, let me just redraw our distributed load varying with epsilon. So this is epsilon, and this is our distributed load w of epsilon right here. So it looks something like this. Bam, let me see if I can make it consistent. There we go. It looks something like this. Okay, now what is the total area under this curve from 0 to delta x? From 0 to delta x. Well, we know, hopefully, that the area under a curve is just the integral. So let's do that. We know that the area under this curve is actually just the integral from 0 to delta x of w of epsilon d epsilon, right? This is where it gets a little bit tricky. So bear with me. What I'm going to do now is focus on something called the mean value theorem. So using the mean value theorem, theorem, we can say that we can say that there must exist there must exist a point C that lies in between that lies in between 0 and delta x, let me zoom down a little bit, such that, such that, and let me just break it into parts, this is, this is our point C just here, it lies somewhere in between 0 and x, such that delta x times by w of C is equal to, is equal to the integral from 0 to delta x, that should be delta x, I just realized, delta x, w of epsilon, d epsilon. Now this is actually a really complicated thing to grasp, but it's really quite simple. Basically it's saying that the total area under this curve is equivalent to a rectangle which has height w of c. So basically this point c has a corresponding height w of c, w of c, and the corresponding area under this rectangle, which is w of c times delta x, let me just draw that, this area under this orange rectangle just here, we'll ha there, there must be a certain point such that the area under this orange rectangle is equal to the area under this blue line, right? And, 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 that's, and that's really a quite math-heavy proof just there, but I hope that makes sense. And the importance of invoking the mean value theorem, um, other than to confuse you, is to say that W of C, W of C must be equal to must be equal to the integral of w of epsilon d epsilon from 0 to delta x divided by delta x, once we divide both sides by delta x. That is the importance of invoking the mean value theorem, because that is exactly what we have here. So we can actually substitute that in now. We can write that's well, that's easy. That's just v of x plus delta x minus v of x divided by delta x must be equal to minus w of c. That's really important. Let me zoom out so you can see that all in one picture. There we go. I hope that makes sense. Okay, that is really important because if we now evaluate the limit, so let's just, let's just focus on limit as delta x approaches 0. If we evaluate this limit, what happens? Well, the left-hand side is simple enough. That, that, that turns into our definition of the derivative. But the right-hand side is even more interesting because if we evaluate the limit as delta x approaches 0, that's basically saying if we get this delta x sign, which I'm drawing in red just here, this delta x, that's basically saying delta x is converging towards the left. Just think about it. If delta x is approaching 0, that means this is getting narrower and narrower. So this is approaching towards the left. But this is the trick. Because c is sandwiched in between 0 and delta x, that means c has no choice but to also move towards the left. To, to the point where, if delta x approaches 0, c must also approach 0. I hope that makes sense. So as delta x approaches 0, that means c, 
our value must also approach zero. And, and, and there's even more you can be, gather from this. That also means that w of c must approach w of zero. That's really crucial. So that's basically saying, well, the c value, when delta x approaches zero, approaches this value just here. I hope that makes sense. Okay? And once we plug that in, then we're left with dv dx, dv dx, that's our definition of the derivative is delta x approaches zero, must be equal to minus w of zero. Now, what is that? Well, don't forget, this is minus w of epsilon is equal to zero, right? And what happens when epsilon is equal to zero? That's at your point x. Remember, let me zoom in so you can see, so I can really emphasize this. When epsilon is equal to zero, that's at your point x. It's right here. It's right here. Let me draw an arrow so you can see it. It's right there when epsilon is equal to zero, which is at your point x. So this, let me zoom out once more. So this becomes dv dx, dv dx at any point x is equal to minus w of x. That is a formal proof, very calculus heavy. All right, guys, in the next video, I'm going to be showing you the proof, which sadly to say is a little bit more complicated for dm dx is equal to v of x. I hope you learned something from that. Cheers.